God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Many new and unusual things today. Uh, First of all, uh, it is the annual vestry meeting of the church today, which is a time to take stock of where we've been the last year and where we're going in the future, and uh, to do things like look at our financial state and to talk about personnel and program and all kinds of of different things. And uh, for the past several years, I've taken this opportunity to uh, give my sort of charge to the parish as my my sermon, Uh, partly because a lot of people don't stick around for the actual vestry meeting. But please do. It's it's actually not as bad as it sounds, going over financial statements and and talking about the future of the church. Uh, And if you are going to leave, at least please take one of uh, of these, which is the annual vestry report, uh, which uh, has all kinds of information and useful tidbits. So uh, please do take that before, before you go. Um, another unusual thing today, uh, we have this layout, uh, which we switched to uh, partly because uh, with the choir singing with organ accompaniment, they need to be close enough to the organ console so that the organist can see them and, and vice versa. So this layout will work better for, for them and for, for Bruce, who's going to be with us for the next couple of months. Uh, but I have to say, it feels very different, doesn't it, to sort of be in, in this kind of a layout. And I'd be, I'd be curious to hear your feedback about what this feels like uh, from, from that perspective. So uh, let me give you my, my, my charge to, uh, to the church this year. Uh, and this is another unusual thing. I'm actually reading from a text today. <laughs> There's a whole pile of books for wannabe CEOs with titles like 12 Keys to Successful Leadership and Leadership Made Easy. In my experience, these books generally say everything that anyone with common sense would learn long before they were put in a position of even modest responsibility, or so we would hope. I've had some bad bosses. Um, these are the kind of books that are often given at these weekend conferences where you go to Reno for a couple of days and they give you a free book and a bunch of DVDs and your company pays thousands of dollars for you to go there and you come back, supposedly now a new minted leader. So one of the things that comes in these uh, sage advices is a little bit of wisdom that says, leave the dance floor from time to time to get a balcony view. This metaphor of the balcony view of the dance floor is actually picked up all through the business leadership literature and even the stuff that has made its way into church land. There's this idea that you should be able to, to leave the daily tasks and engagement of leadership to get a strategic bird's eye view of what's going on. One imagines an elegant waltz with orderly swirling beautiful dresses, neat geometric patterns folding and unfolding under a protective paternal eye. Would that it were so easy. In truth, my experience is more like a square dance where the band is high on crystal meth and the calls are in heavily accented Burmese dialect that no one in the dance can understand. Phonetically, we go from one partner to the next, staying with one just long enough to get some kind of sync before being tossed off to the next. You see, church land these days is full of leaders who not only don't know the steps of this crazy dance that we call parish leadership, but can't even figure out what the time signature is. So most of us, me, my colleagues, our bishops too, are simply improvising as best we can, stumbling and lurching as we go. The old ways simply won't hold. Everybody knows the tune is changing. The wise ones say that we will make new patterns, and they will make themselves known. After all, even a mosh pit has boundaries. Follow the Holy Spirit, they say. Look for the Spirit's work. Make fresh wineskins. How on earth do we do that? question has been preoccupying me and many others for some time. Maybe we start by trying to stop. Is it possible to carve out some islands of stillness on the swirling dance floor of life and ministry? Can we find our center of gravity for a second and take a breath, just one small breath? This past year has been incredibly challenging for me after the heartbreak of the collapse of what had been a wonderful partnership with Eric, our former music minister. I had to go through some wilderness wandering of my own. I had to rediscover and reconstruct what I believed to be true about music and worship in church. It was not an easy process, but it was a necessary one, both for me and for the parish. We had to discover what was essential and true about worship. For example, we quickly discovered that leaflets are a good thing. They're actually quite helpful for people. We also discovered that leading hymns is hard. It's not just a magic thing that sort of happens when people have a piece of paper in front of them. You actually have to have good leadership to make good hymn singing happen. 
With very limited administrative support, I had to figure out what was essential there, too. Some days, the essential thing is unclogging a toilet, which I've had to do more than once in the last year. Other days, it's ordering cleaning supplies or scheduling space bookings. At one point, I prayed in frustration, I'd like to get back to being a priest, God. In response to that prayer, I found myself having to clean up a particularly nasty mess left by a parishioner, which reminded me right quick what God thinks of being a priest. Being a priest, apparently, is about creating safe space for people and teaching them about Jesus, and sometimes that does mean changing light bulbs and cleaning up messes and filling out paperwork and cleaning toilets. Get over it, God seemed to be saying. I sound some solace in the last year with theological interns. Uh, poor Nancy, one time we spent a whole hour talking about how to move in worship. We walked up and down the space here when it was, was empty. This is essential, I told her. To master worship, you must learn to move like ninja, ghost walker, tea ceremony priest. You know what I'm talking about, Joe. <laughs> it was wonderful to rediscover the fundamentals with her, to unpack everything that I learned in seminary that I needed to learn but didn't learn, and then repackage it again for her and to walk with her through that, that journey. Interestingly, when I uh, ran into her recently and, and we had a long talk, I asked her what was the most valuable thing that you learned uh, from me in your, your time here. And she said, the spirituality of preparing for worship and the spirituality that goes into doing all the stuff that makes worship happen. And I thought, you know what? If I have left this intern with nothing else, I am satisfied with that by and large. By the time summer came, I was nearly burned out. I made the most of my vacation visiting family in the States, but quickly found myself back in the dance of Messiah. Things didn't really begin to turn around until the Labor Day weekend. You see, when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time in the woods. I was a country boy who took naps on a chicken shed and was a crack shot with a BB gun. You know, those little BB guns, which are pretty harmless. I used to be able to hit our barn, which was about 50 yards away, uh, I would just open up the back uh, sliding glass door from the living room and just kind of rest the rifle on my, on my, uh, my knee, and I could uh, hit the barn from there. And I knew that I had hit the wood part of the barn and not the metal part from the, from the sound. <laughs> That's a country boy, right? <laughs> I spent hours exploring the wheat fields around my childhood home in Kansas, and I think I've missed something of that wilderness living in the city. So I decided somewhat abruptly to take Betsy and Henry on a canoe camping trip. After a great deal of preparation, including weathering the concerned expressions of people who thought we were nuts to take an 18-month-old on a serious camping trip, we strapped a friend's canoe to our car and headed for the woods. One of the blessings of this fine country is that you can go from a Sunday worship service on Sunday morning to a remote campsite by canoe before nightfall. It was amazing. As soon as we settled into camp for the first night, I knew I was tapping into something very deep and essential a solid core of mystical juju that had been temporarily obscured by the orbiting dust of fleeting concerns. I breathed easy. As Henry slept in the tent and Betsy and I enjoyed wine by the fire, we talked about church and about life and about what is true and essential. Two days later, as we paddled back to the goat ramp, Henry fell asleep on a pile of blankets in the bottom of the canoe. The craft felt light and the air was crisp and cool. Betsy and I settled into a fast, efficient stroke. We arrived so early at the ramp that we ended up hovering a few hundred meters from the shore and letting the wind spin us in lazy arcs, taking pictures of each other, you know, the mountains in the background. Uh, But the Buddhists have a saying. They say, before enlightenment, we fetch wood and carry water. After enlightenment, we fetch wood and carry water. When it came back to Toronto, there were still leaflets to write and musicians to hire and projects to manage. But it did feel lighter. The grief for things left undone was just where I had left it. So too was the promise of things to come. They were both next to a pile of papers on my desk, I think. There were chairs to arrange and reports to write, planning, coaching, begging, worrying, praying, all of it just where I had left it. But it was all a little different, too. Truth is, I have no idea what the steps are to this crazy dance that we're doing together, but I'm not sure that it really matters. You see, the point of dancing was never to make pleasing geometric patterns of swirling tool. The point of dancing is to have fun. It's about joy and it's about life. Jesus didn't come into this earth to give us a divinely inspired self-help book. Twelve easy steps to being a worthy person. Baloney. No one would live up to that. Read the Old Testament if you don't believe me. He came to give us life and that abundantly. 
Life is messy and clumsy and awkward and sometimes painful. There are hellos and goodbyes and stinky messes. There's also beauty and truth and love and peace. God is love. And we, God's church, are in the business of giving that love out to the world. There is no other worthy criteria for success. Everything else, everything, budgets, staffing, programs, even worship, serves that mission. That is the essential thing. So go ahead, dance your crazy dance. Flail your arms around like a spasmatic white boy at the junior prom on fire. Dance, dance, or we are all lost, says the choreographer. Dance your grief away. Shake off your doubt with a shuffle and find your groove. Don't just walk out of your deserts of temptation. Dance out of them. If you can't find your step, give me your hand and I'll pull you along. But for God's sake, don't sit out. Don't hide behind the punch bowl and miss out because God is playing our psalm. Number 150. Hallelujah. Praise God in his holy temple. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him for the excellent greatness. Praise him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise him with lyre and harp. Praise him with timbrel and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. My prayer for us for the next year is simply that having come through this wilderness experience in the last year, we will hold close to us those things that we have discovered to be essential, which is nothing else other than the pure essence of God, which is the love we know in Jesus Christ.